harder. And then once we get to the end of the presentation, I'm happy to take questions orally. Okay. So does actually, does anyone know what the end time is for our session? Just so I can keep track of time. Does anyone know? Okay, well, we'll go until they, they cut me off. <laughs> all right, so I am really delighted to be here with all of you today to talk about the situation facing Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims in Xinjiang. Um, for those of you um, who have either been to China or to Central Asia, Xinjiang is um, this area in Northwest China. It's a very vast area. It's actually, I've never been there, but my understanding is that it's a gorgeous area in terms of terrain. It's like high desert. And this Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, which I'm going to refer to as Xinjiang, is home to nearly 22 million people, including millions of Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims. Um, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang have lived there for many, many years. And in China, they are a religious minority. And as such, they have faced intense persecution and oppression for many, many years. Um, I don't want to say forever, but for as long as, as we've, we've known, they've been uh, oppressed. Um, but more recently, in the last three years, the um, repression campaign uh, that has been pursued by the Chinese Communist Party has really intensified not only in the Xinjiang district, but against Uyghurs and Turkic Muslims all over the world, including reaching the Uyghur diaspora, even in places like the United States. Um, since 2017, the Chinese government has detained an estimated 1 million Uyghurs and other Muslims in Xinjiang. Um, can someone give me a thumbs up? Do you see the, the slide with three women? Is that, is that, is that what's appearing on your screen share? Uh, we do not. We see what the. Is on, what is on your website. screen share? The website. The website about Moderna? Uh, yeah. Oh, hold on. Okay, forgive me. I've been going through this. Let me try again. Sorry. Do you now see the, 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 the three women? Yes. Uh, we do. Maybe you can hit the present button and it would like do a full screen version of it. Uh, slide slideshow at the top there. Oh, slideshow. I'm sorry, slideshow. Oh, here. Yep. And from current slide. Maybe that oh, one. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so, uh, th so this was the map that I just showed, uh, I thought I was showing just a moment ago. So this is the area of the uh, Xinjiang uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region located in, nor in Northwestern China. Um, so since 2017, uh, the Chinese government has detained an estimated 1 million Uyghurs and other Muslims in what they call these mass re-education camps. Um, they've also, the Chinese government has also pursued a campaign of mass surveillance, political indoctrination, and forced cultural assimilation, assimilation. The Chinese authorities have passed a law against de-extremification, and offenses include growing, an, quote, an abnormal beard, wearing a veil or headscarf, praying, and fasting. So clearly, these are regular common day actions that are practiced by uh, Uyghurs and other Muslims. Um, the, st the, the, the stories of heartbreak are just really unbelievable. These are just a, a sample of a few family members who are on the outside who don't know where their loved ones are. They believe their loved ones have been detained and they remain cut off from each other, no communication, no information about their family member and loved one's whereabouts. Bota Kusain is one of these um, one of these cases. She is an ethnic Kazakh from Xinjiang, and her family resettled to Kazakhstan in 2013. Her father returned to China in late 2017 to see a doctor and she has not seen her father since. 
uh, Chinese authorities confiscated his passport and sent him to one of these so-called re-education camps. The last time she spoke with her father was over WeChat three years, three years ago in November of 2017. When she was interviewed by Amnesty International investigators, she said, we can't laugh anymore and we can't sleep at night. We live in fear every day. We don't know where he is. We don't even know if he's still alive. I want to see my father again. Um, Kairat Samarkand was sent to a detention camp in October 2017, and this drawing is his um, depiction of the re-education camp that he was sent to. As you can see, there's barbed wire. Um, it looks very much like a prison. Uh, he was hooded, made to wear shackles on his arms and legs, and was forced to stand in a fixed position for 12 hours when he was first detained by Chinese authorities. This cruel treatment drove him to attempt suicide just before he was released. In addition to all of the mass detentions and the separation between families and loved ones, the Chinese government has repeatedly and steadfastly resisted calls to admit independent monitors into the Xinjiang region. The government is only allowing carefully choreographed tours for select diplomats and journalists, which surprisingly are made to look very good and very humane. Amnesty International has been urging world leaders from across the world, but particularly Muslim countries to visit the Xinjiang region. Here's a photograph of a protest during the Chinese premier's um, 2018 visit to the Netherlands, where here Amnesty uh, Netherlands activists are confronting the Chinese premier about the Chinese government's maltreatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. The China's campaign against Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims extends well beyond China's boundaries. As I mentioned earlier, Chinese embassies and consulates abroad collect information about members of these groups residing in other countries, even in the United States. We know that the Chinese government is actively tracking the Uyghur diaspora. Here's an example of one such person. Gori Askar is a teacher living in the United States. She's holding up a photo of her brother, whom she has not seen in over a year. She has received intimidating telephone calls from the Chinese consulate in Houston, asking for her personal information. And she had heard that her brother was likely detained in Xinjiang. She has been trying to get information about his situation or whereabouts has not succeeded to date. Here's another Uyghur activist, Rushan Abbas, here in front of Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. Her life was turned upside down when her sister was detained in Xinjiang in September 2018, two years ago. She believes that her sister was detained just a few days after her sister made a speech condemning the mass detention of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. She says, this is a tactic by Beijing to silence me and stop my legal activism in the United States. There isn't a day that I have not spoken about this horrendous atrocity. And you can see she's um, carrying a photo of her sister with the tagline, where is my sister? She was a doctor, no need for vocational training. Yunus Toti, was a student in Egypt when Chinese police contacted him through WeChat and asked for personal details. A few months later, the police uh, called Yunus's brother in Turkey. They told him they were standing next to his parents and that he should return to Xinjiang, which he understood to be an implicit threat against his parents' safety. He subsequently lost contact with his family in Xinjiang and to this day, he worries that they have been detained or are facing even worse treatment. For those of you who may not be able to see the text in the WeChat, um, it's been reproduced here, but here the text shows the Xinjiang police 
with the message, I know you are studying in Egypt. What's your passport number? Where are you staying? How many ethnic minority classmates are with you? And Eunice Tokti re responds, why are you asking? And then the re response from Xinjiang police is, think about your family in Xinjiang if you do not answer my questions. China has a history of pressuring host countries to deport Uyghur, as Uyghur asylum seekers. And many of these people believe that they would be sent to camps if they were deported back to China. In response, this year, Congress passed and President Trump signed into law the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act in June 2020. This is a major human rights achievement. And as somebody who works full time with Congress and the federal government, I do remind people that even under this administration, there have been major strides to defend and protect human rights, especially for the Uyghurs. This has been our signature achievement in 2020. The law, among other things, requires the State Department to report on mass detention, surveillance, and other human rights abuses by the Chinese government against Uyghurs and other ethnic minority groups in Xinjiang. And finally, I've included for further reading and research some of Amnesty International's resources, reports, and outputs regarding the treatment of Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims. So with that, I thank you for your patience and I, um, and especially with my uh, technical challenges and I'm happy to take any questions. Sorry, I cannot see, are, are there questions in the chat? Uh, no questions yet. But uh, guys, yeah, feel free to write any questions in the chat. Um, or I'm happy to take questions um, if you want to pose them to me directly, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi. Thank you for speaking with us about this. Um, so my question was, you know, a lot of people have heard a little bit about these camps, and I think just in general, many people are just horrified and wondering, like, what, why they're still open, why they're still operating, and how an atrocity like this can continue to happen when there's um, awareness about it already to a certain degree. So I was wondering if you could speak more about, you know, how that type of situation is navigated. Okay, sure. I mean, your question is a great question. It kind of goes to the heart of what does it mean to be an international human rights activist. Um, so the reason it's, it's continued is because the Chinese government has direct control over the Xinjiang region. Um, the Chinese government has a history of repressive tactics against many groups of people. Um, not just the Xinjiang. And so, for instance, no other foreign country can go in, like the United States cannot enter the Xinjiang region and do anything without the Chinese government's permission and consent. Or if, the, if, if any other country were to do that, that would be a violation of, that, of China's sovereignty and that could result in um, war. So what we're left with are other measures to try to persuade or deter the Chinese government from continuing their atrocities. So the, the law that I just mentioned, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, among other things, they, um, the law requires the Trump administration or the federal government to identify companies that are engaged in business in Xinjiang, individuals that are engaged in business in Xinjiang, and to potentially subject them to sanctions and other visa restrictions. And the thinking behind this is that um, the, the law is designed to make business and life difficult for those people who are profiteering from business in the Xinjiang region. 
and then that will, we hope, translate into a message to Chinese authorities. Um, we also are seeking redress through the UN and other international mechanisms. But again, um, even the UN cannot enter Xinjiang on its own. It would have to obtain the permission or con consent of China. And that's true of any country. Like if the, if the UN wanted to come into the United States and, and launch an official investigation, they could only do that with the permission of the US government. Thank you. Thank you, Zoha, for your question. Uh, we do have another question in the chat. Do you have any ideas on how we as medical students could be helpful to fight against this atrocity? I do. Um, so Physicians for Human Rights, I should just say, has been a tremendous partner to Amnesty International and at my primer, prior employer, the American Civil Liberties Union, I worked there for a decade directing their national immigration policy advocacy program. So I think PHR and I think medical students in general, you have, um, you are you are the medical experts. You're, you are viewed as non-biased, non-political, that your focus is first and foremost on saving lives and doing no harm. I think it's incredibly important to be researching and producing documentation about the health and mental health effects of mass detention, mass surveillance, mass persecution on the Uyghurs. Now, obviously, I'm guessing that most of you do not have access to the Xinjiang region, but there are um, ethnic Uyghurs in diaspora around the world certainly here in the United States, in Turkey, Central Asia. And Amnesty International has interviewed some of these people. But my colleagues, as terrific as they are, are not medical or mental health experts. They'll be the first ones to say that. And so I think it's incredibly important for the medical community to be producing reports that document the long term and what I suspect are permanent effects on people's medical and mental health, even if they are not the ones who've been directly detained. Just like, what does it mean for all these different family members to go for years without knowing if their loved one in Xinjiang is alive, where they are, what they're facing, and having no recourse? I think that's incredibly important to document. And so, that's a place where PHR, I would urge you to consider investing your time and your resources, and we'd be happy to partner with you on that. Hi, um, I had a question a little bit on um, Xinjiang's status as an autonomous region within China. Um, and I was wondering if you had any information on how far reaching that autonomy was and what China's role is in the region, like their presence, and if they could be incriminated on a basis of occupation rather than just the camps, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I, I, your question is really a great question. And it, I received a similar question along those lines with respect to Hong Kong, right? Because Hong Kong is also supposed to be quasi autonomous. Let me just say, I have to clarify this, Amnesty International does not take a position on the legality of Xinjiang being an autonomous region, nor do we opine on whether it is in fact an autonomous region. Um, I would say that the facts speak for themselves, that if people are being arbitrarily arrested and detained in mass camps, if their family members cannot gain access to them, find out their whereabouts or even know if they're, alive, if they're alive, then it's clear that the Chinese government has full power and authority, whether it's legal or not. In brass tacks speaking, they have full power and authority over the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims in Xinjiang. Um, so that's, I think, just a reality that we all have to contend with. I don't see the status of Xinjiang changing 
there definitely are separatist movements or independence movements, depending on how who you talk to and how it be characterized. China, the China's China's government at different times has explained or justified their actions as an attempt to suppress separatists. Um, but you know, I just want to be very clear: Amnesty International does not take a position on you know whether we support separatist movements or independence movements, but no matter what, we strongly believe that all governments and authorities have to respect, protect, and defend of the human rights of all people. And that is clearly not what is happening in Xinjiang with respect to the Uyghurs and Turkic Muslims. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you. I had a question. Um, so we heard from Dr. Abdul and Dr. Peeler about the, the need to take a, a systems approach. It was very interesting to learn about that. A systems approach, like a engineering type of approach to tackling some of these problems where these problems are not only attacking the root problem, but also attacking the things that lead back to the root problem. Like there's some sort of feedback system. So would you say that, um, for the discrimination that's happening in China, is there any um, specific part that we might be able to address in order to attack the system as a whole? So I, 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 don't, I mean, I don't know, I didn't hear the two doctors that you're referencing before. I think I can appreciate the point. I think, um, I would say it's very hard for people outside of a country to think about trying to solve another country's problems, right? I mean, so since we literally are foreign and alien to that country's situation, but I would, I do think that the point is well taken. I mean, even if you were to look at what our country is grappling with and the racial reckoning that our country has been contending with in 2020, in the year of you know George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and so many other names that continue to be added to the list of Black lives lost on right here in the United States by law enforcement. Definitely there are people saying that the time has come for a reckoning that goes back hundreds of years to the fact that a whole swath of people were um, enslaved and that our country is still living with that legacy. And until we root out um, systemic racism by looking at the root causes, we're not going to get to a place of uh, reconciliation and progress and peace. So I understand that. At the same time, however, I strongly believe that, and I forgive me for using a medical metaphor, but you know, when a patient comes into the ER, there's some things you have to do that are, are you know, a matter of life and death, right? Like if there is um, mortal bleeding that isn't immediately contained, that person is not going to be um, ready to go into surgery. Hey, I'm basing all of that on years of watching ER and Grey's Anatomy. So <laughs> you guys will know better than I. So I do think, you know, if you look at the Uyghur situation, we've got plenty of those emergency human rights violations that just have to stop. And, and you know the mass detention, the torture inside, the family separation, like those are just atrocities that are immediate and long-term and likely permanent in terms of their impact. So um, I think our role as people outside of Xinjiang, as outside of the United States, but who believe in human rights, who believe in the right to um, healthcare, who believe in the right to dignity and medical treatment, that we need to be utilizing all the access points and all the resources that we have and bring that to bear to exert pressure on the Chinese government and to really shame them for, for what they are doing. China is definitely the world power going into the 21st century and is, it, as we can tell, is already calling the shots um, well beyond China's borders. And so if we don't use this opportunity now to try to stand up to the Chinese and to insist that they respect the human rights of people within their borders, 
what are we going to do if they just continue this, these practices and it's uncountenanced. Thank you. So I wrote in the chat box too, I'm happy to take questions on any other country or any other region because Amnesty International does work on human rights around the world. I can't pretend to be an expert on every, every country and region, but I'm happy to take any questions and give it a try. We do have another question in the chat. It's a follow-up question. Follow-up, is there international talk and giving groups like UN, Amnesty International, more jurisdiction and actual power to step in when these events occur, including, as you say, problems on our own soil? U.S. soil. I, I like how you're thinking. Um, let me just say that um, not, not so much to give us access, Amnesty International access, but certainly um, I think you folks will know better than I, like what kind of battles like the International Committee for Red Cross or Red Crescent face in gaining access to conflict zones and to um, detention centers and prisons around the world. I think that has to be fought for every single day, every single day. Um, the UN, and I should pause for a moment to just comment on this, I think people are well aware that under the current administration, um, the US government has exited from multiple UN conventions, bodies, and agreements. So those include like some of the more famous ones, I guess, right, are the World Health Organization that the U.S. exited this year, um, the Paris Climate Accords that the U.S. Uh, disavowed a few years ago, the U.N. Human Rights Council that the U.S. exited in 2018, the U.N. Economic and Social Council, which the U.S. exited, I forgot when. So one of the top orders for the Biden-Harris incoming administration will be to re-enter, re-engage, and return to these international bodies. Um, and let me just say that um, it's not as if our absence is, has had no consequence. There, there have been changes in these international and UN bodies. And so um, it is going to take a long time to kind of reassure the international community and other world leaders that the US is fully committed, at least under President Biden, to meet its obligations as a leading country in the international community. I think there is serious concern that what has happened under this administration, people worry that that could be the tack taken by future Republican presidents, not just this president. And um, as you know, we can't have a situation where the US is in for four years and then out for another four and then maybe in, um, and that would not um, serve anyone well when you're talking about uh, trying to get pressure placed at the international level. Um, the, one of the question, challenges we face is that there are certain countries at the UN who have that have veto power. The United States has veto power. China has veto power. Um, Russia has veto power. It's not, it's not surprising which countries do. And um, I would like to think that all the different countries operate in a very fair and impartial manner at the UN, but they tend to operate according to self-interest. So one of the challenges um, we have faced at the international level is that this China has veto power. And so um, anything that the UN seeks to do vis-a-vis -vis China, of course, right, China can veto, um, but it, um, it also means that the UN countries and the UN are, are going head to head with China. And Part of what we are encouraging the UN to do is to do that um, and to not just to shy, not, not to shy away from the big countries just because they have veto power. China has increased influence too in the UN because they are giving more and more money um, to these international bodies. So even this summer when the US exited from the World Health Organization and the US when Trump announced that we were going to exit, the U.S. up to that point have been the single largest donor to WHO. And the second largest donor was the Gates Foundation. So while the U.S. announced its departure, China announced that it was increasing its contributions to the WHO, which I think are welcome. But, you know, with increased money comes increased influence, access and power. 
So um, I think the question, the, I've answered it as best I can, which is very roundabout. Um, unfortunately, it's not so linear. Um, and, uh, and it's a challenge that we're just gonna have to contend with going forward, so. Thank you, Joanne. Um, next question we have is, we see that the current administration is preparing to withdraw troops from Afghanistan as current peace talks fail, and there are daily, as current peace talks fail, there are daily bombings, target school, targeting schools and reporters. What are your thoughts? Is it likely yeah, that- Yeah, I love these from? questions. Um, okay, so actually I'm going to pull up. So I should just say that, um, The United, uh, sorry, Amnesty International. I'm going to put in in, in the bat, uh, chat uh, our country brief to the Biden transition team on Afghanistan. So all of this is on our website. Um, actually, if you click on there, it's a gorgeous photo. I mean, of the mountains in Afghanistan um, in the background. But you're absolutely right that the Trump administration in their final weeks are taking major actions um, on, the, on the military front. Um, so what we are recommending um, is that we don't have a position on, on the, the timing, the cir circumstances of withdrawal of US troops. We actually don't take a position on war or peace. Um, we're not a peace-based organization per se, but we do worry about the tre treatment of civilians during uh, times of war and conflict. So we definitely advocate for the protection of human rights for all people in conflict situations in Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere. So we're to, what our recommendations are is that the US should demand that the Taliban accept the participation of key Afghan women leaders from government and civil society as a precondition for the talks moving forward. Honestly, this has been a NASP for over 10 years. Um, we've also been urging that the US negotiating team led by Ambassador Khalizad be staffed with human rights and gender specialists at the highest levels. Um, and um, that's consistent with the US's requirements under um, human rights laws. And we have, a, the State Department also has a special ambassador dedicated to global women's issues. Um, and then finally, the only, the other, the other um, reform we've been pushing for is that the president of the United States commit to supporting Afghan women and girls after the withdrawal of US military forces in Afghanistan. And that this commitment must also extend to providing Afghan women a pivotal role in resolving um, the conflict as part of any future uh, for, for women's peace and security. So, you know, I'm, we don't have a, I don't have a direct answer to your question because that just kind of is outside the bounds of what, what Amnesty's um, policy uh, limits. But I think your question is a good one. And um, I do think the question of when and how to withdraw from Afghanistan, the US's longest standing war, Iraq, the US's second longest standing war has been one that has bedeviled um, presidents of all, both political parties and um, the only thing that Amnesty International is, is working to ensure is that um, the U.S. Um, do everything possible to make sure that the concerns and needs of Afghan women and girls are considered through that whole process. And I should mention, um, I'm going to send to you right now, uh, like if you have country, uh, questions on any country or any region of the world and wanna know what Amnesty International USA is recommending, you can just visit this website, which is searchable by region and by country. And that's where you can get information about um, what, we're, what we're pushing for. And that's on our website. Can you all see that in the link in the chat box? Yep, we can see it. So do you, do you see the map right now in your Zoom screen share? Do people see that? Can someone answer yes or no? Yep. Okay, 
So these are the countries around the world where we have um, had researchers and have developed policy briefs. So for instance, when I got the qu question on Afghanistan, I came down here to Europe and Central Asia. I clicked on Afghanistan. Here's the beautiful photograph landscape. We have a brief that analyzes the human rights issues in Afghanistan, details the human cost. And then at the end, we have recommendations to the Biden administration, as well as contact information. So if you wanted to find out more about Afghanistan, you would contact my colleague, Daniel Balson. He's listed, his information is listed here. Hope that's useful to people. Are there other questions? So if there are no other questions, I will give you back two minutes of your day. I want to thank all of you for um, joining this breakout session. I am really so pleased to see the intense interest from medical students who are willing to give up their Saturday to learn more about the treatment of Uyghurs, Turkic Muslims um, in Xinjiang. I encourage you to keep up your tremendous work because the country needs you, the world needs you now more than ever. And I will put my contact information in the chat um, and you should feel free. I know you folks probably don't email, um, <laughs> but here's my uh, email address. And I'm also including our website. So I encourage you to, uh, explore all of our, our materials and contact me with any questions. Thank you all. I had a quick question. Oh, sure. Um, I was wondering to what extent has Western Islamophobia factored into how neglected like the Uyghur Muslim crisis has been? Oh, it's interesting. Um, so I would say that the oppression of Uyghurs and Turkic Muslims in China has been long standing. Um, so I don't think it is, is, I don't think it's driven by Western xenophobia. Um, I do think it contributes to an overall hostility um, towards Muslims in many parts of the world. I don't want to say throughout the world, but in many parts of the world. And we certainly see that here in the United States, um, most, most patently in the, in the context of like the, the multiple Muslim bans. Um, but we've also seen this, you know, for instance, with respect to the Rohingya, Rohingya Muslims that have been subject to ethnic cleansing and atrocities by the Myanmar military, and nearly a million of whom have, have fled to neighboring Bangladesh. So um, Amnesty International has actually found that with respect to lawmakers here in the United States, Republicans and Democrats, the, the two areas where we've been able to work productively and efficiently on human rights has been with respect to the treatment of Muslim minorities in Xinjiang and the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. So um, I do think that there is space for continuing to push for these advances, but um, there are lawmakers we work with who are champions of um, ending human rights against Uyghurs in China, but who at the same time support the president's Muslim ban here. So in my mind, it's a disconnect, but in, in, in other people's minds, they're not inconsistent. So thank you for the question. Are there any other questions? Sebastian, are we going back to the main room or are we staying where we are? I, I believe Sebastian will be moving us back into the main room shortly. Okay, thank you. 